If you're looking for a really good DIY solution for filling cracks, holes or wall chasers, then look no further because in today's video I'm going to be showing you the tried and tested formula that I've used over the years for all wall repairs around the house. Today's repair is specifically to do with these wall chasers behind me, but the processes that I outlined today will apply to any cracks, holes, or other repairs that you've got to make to your masonry or plasterboard walls. There are obviously lots of ways you can repair your walls, but I'm going to outline in today's video my favorite ways of doing it so that you can decide which solution works best for your situation. And I should point out that whilst today's fillers are exclusively manufactured by British Gypsum, I have no affiliation to them. They're not sponsoring this video or otherwise paying for it in any way. For the first deeper chase that I've recently done myself to make way for a new electrical socket, I'm going to be filling the bulk of the chase with thistle bonding coat and applying a Giprock Easy Fill Skim on top. And then for the second chase, which is the repair of an existing electrical socket that was damaged by rodents, I'm going to be showing you the versatility of Easy Fill by filling the entire chase with this wonderful material. So in today's toolkit, in addition to the obvious two main materials, we've got PVA, a few old mixing buckets and a builder's bucket and mixing paddle that you want to use for mixing larger quantities of materials which we're not going to need today. Plasterer's hawk and a plastering trowel together with a selection of smaller smoothing and forming tools, a sanding block and a paintbrush. And as usual, details of all the tools I've used in today's video will be in the description at the end of the video. Now, before I start, I should just point out that this is an internal upstairs wall that has been previously rendered and plastered back in the 70s. I'm not worried about damp up here. If you've got an external downstairs wall that does have a few damp problems, you don't want to use this bonding because bonding can attract damp. If you're worried about breathability, and you're worried about continuing with the integrity of what's already there and you've got a lime based rendered wall then my suggestion would be fill your chasers with a lime based render. Alternatively if it's not lime based then you can just use a sand and cement based render as I have done in the past. I enjoy working with sand and cement but the thing about it is it's a bit harder to knock up than the bonding is. It's much less easy to apply than bonding. So as I'm going to be using bonding and easy fill today, let's take a quick look at what's available because different options can be a little bit confusing. And what I mean by that is there are two different types of bonding coat. There's a standard and then there's the bonding coat 60. And then in terms of the easy fill, you've got three different types of easy fill. You've got the easy fill 20, you've got the easy fill 60, and then a smaller box which has five one kilogram sachets. And whilst a little confusing, this is actually great because each product has a different working and a different setting time. So you've got to think about the job you've got to do and pick the right product for the job. The standard bonding coat with its 45 to 90 minute working time and 120 minute setting time is seen very much as a base coat and you'll see builders using this on large sections of wall. Bonding 60 with its shorter 45 minute working time and 60 minute setting time is seen much more as a repair and patch filler. Similarly, the Easy Fill 20 with its 20 minute working time and 20 to 30 minute setting time is seen as a filler for small holes and cracks. Whereas the Easy Fill 60 with its 60 minute working time and 140 minute setting time is much more of a bulk filling and finishing filler. And finally, the smaller box of Easy Fill with its one kilogram sachets is very much a snagging filler. And this stuff is great. I've used it in the past. The beauty is you can open one one kilogram bag for a small job without worrying about the rest of the box going off before you next need to use it. So clearly I should be using bonding 60 rather than the standard bonding coat. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that I'm not. I'm using the standard left behind by my plaster. He used it to build out the ceiling to get these nice curves before plastering. So I guess it serves to illustrate you needn't get too hung up about all these working setting times, but it will make your life easier if you pick the right product. Also, for the sake of completeness, I should point out if you prefer to buy ready mix filler, Bonding 60 and Easy Filler come in ready mix tubs, as does the lightweight non-slump Easy Filler Light, which is meant for deep holes or cracks, and Easy Filler Finish, which is designed to cover larger areas. The biggest attraction of ready mix fillers is obviously the convenience factor and possibly less wastage but they are going to be more expensive 
and they don't perform as well as the powdered equivalents. Particularly in terms of the thickness that you can fill to, propensity of them to slump, I guess less so with the Easy Filler Lite. And in the past, I've tended to find that ready mix fillers are more susceptible to shrink when they're setting than their powdered equivalents. For more information on all these products, check out the British Gypsum website, a link to which will be in the description at the end of the video. So that's quite enough of me rambling on. Let's crack on with the repair. And the first all important step we've got to do is PVA the surfaces that we're filling. And there are two reasons for that. Point one, I always think that if the surfaces are still a bit dusty, you haven't probably vacuumed them down properly, the PVA knits all that dust grip together and creates a really good key for your filler. Point two, what it does in sealing that surface is it reduces the suction on the surface and therefore stops the filler drying out too quickly and cracking. This is a super PVA, but to be honest with you, any PVA will do. And I've got an old container, because I don't need a lot. Um, I find these containers really useful for little jobs like this. We're not going to put too much PVA in here, because we haven't got a huge amount to do. I've got a one inch paintbrush here. You can actually use something slightly smaller than this. Right, we don't need a lot of water. I'm just going to put in a little bit. So that's our mixture, as you can see, it's quite a watery mix. We're just putting the PVA onto the brickwork. Because the brickwork, no matter, this has been well vacuumed, but it's still got a bit of a dusty surface. The watery mix is quite good in this situation, because if, if you didn't dilute the PVA enough, you might find, because the brick's quite dusty, that it doesn't actually sink into the bricks properly. We're also going to repair the plaster work up the front here, which has got slightly damaged when I cut in for this new electrical back box. And now on to step two, it's time to mix and apply the bonding. So I've got a little bit of water in my tub, and this is one of the hardest things to get right. Because if you put too much water in your tub, you can end up wasting a whole load of bonding or filler, whatever it is you're using. So there's just something you have to experiment with. When I do the easy fill in a minute, I'm going to show you a different technique, which is much more foolproof. getting to the right sort of consistency now. We'll put a little bit more in. You can see it has quite a grainy appearance, this stuff, but what you find with it is it's much easier to work with than sand and cement. Right, I'm happy with that. Now, for those of you thinking, why is he using that stupid little pot to mix bonding? I would say, this is only a small job, which is why I'm only using a small pot. When I pulled the skirting board off this wall originally, it took all the plaster off and render with it. So to prep it before my friend Gerald came to re-plaster, I did need a lot more bonding. For that, I used my 25 litre ox bucket, as opposed to this 15 litre bucket. And I used my mixing paddle. So all I can say is it's horses for courses, Think about the size of the job that you've got in hand and tailor the tools you need accordingly. Now, there are a couple of reasons why I think even us lowly DIYers need to invest in one of these, a plasterous hawk. Even when we're mixing really small quantities of bonding like this, but particularly when you're mixing large quantities where it becomes an absolute necessity. First point is when you're filling, it just becomes a bit of a pain re reaching in and out of your bucket all the time. Particularly if you've got a large bucket trowel like this. So, being able to deposit all of your filler onto your hawk before you start eliminates a lot of faffing around and gives you the perfect platform to work off, particularly if, like now, we're going to be using a plastering trowel. You've got a lot more feel with a decorator's hawk like this because you can just pick up your filler or whatever it is, apply it to the wall, and then crucially, clean off whatever you don't need, which leaves your 
trowel ready for the next application. The other great thing about this hawk that you don't get fishing stuff out of a bucket is say you don't want to use your long edge to take the filler, say you want to use your short edge, again you can just scoop it up and then apply it to your wall. So whatever job you've got in mind, large or small, I really recommend you invest in one of these. If you tried to do this with just a decorator's knife like this, you'd find it sort of fall, it falls out and it's just a much more fiddly job. Whereas with the plastering trout, fish bash bosh, it goes in so easily. When compared with sand and cement, which would be dropping to the floor every moment I was doing this, it's just an incredibly malleable substance to work with. It's almost slightly elastic. The other tool that's really useful in these situations is this small tool. And again, recommend you getting one of these. Just a really nice tool to get into the tricky gaps. But because this chase was obviously so close to the floor, it was quite fiddly getting any of my tools near enough, so I ended up using the applicator tool that came with my two-part wood filler. And finally, it's always a good idea to roughen or scratch the surface to provide a key for the next coat. And to do that, I improvised with a little block of wood and a couple of screws in it because I don't have a devil float, which is the bespoke tool for this purpose. With the bonding coat now set, it's time for a little more PVA. I've kept some watered down PVA in a jar for a couple of weeks and whilst not strictly speaking necessary I'm just PVAing the bonding before applying the easy fill top coat and you'll see here the bonding is about three four millimeters below the line of the plaster which should give me a nice depth for the easy fill. Now the established wisdom in the industry is always to pour your mixture into the water, whether you're talking about plasterboard adhesive or filler or bonding like we are today. And I don't disagree with that. However, as I explained earlier on, when you're putting powder into water, it's really hard to get the amount of mixture right. So I'm gonna explain a really good technique now, turning it on its head for us DIYers to give you much more control, particularly where, like here, we're only lo looking at using very small quantities of filler. I'm gonna pour a little bit of filler into the pot we used earlier. That's going to be more than enough for our job. And I'm just going to very gradually add water to the mix. Because you don't want to overdo it, otherwise you're defeating the object of this technique. And that is pretty much as much water as we need. The downside of this technique is you're more likely to get lumps of unmixed filler. So if you're going to do it this way, make sure you mix it really thoroughly. Back on my hawk, as I did with the bonding. And then it's onto the wall with a filler, applying it with my plastering trowel. Very slightly proud of the surface so that when we sand it back we get it beautifully flush with the surface that's why I'm not really sc scraping it so that it's flush You can see this is all I've got left from that feather we've just mixed. I think we've got the quantities bang on. Which I think shows the benefit of mixing the filler in this way. Okay, so that's that repair done. 
I'm pretty pleased with that. We'll let that set. So for this, the last repair, we're just going to use Easy Fill without bonding. And because here we're using a larger amount of filler, I'm going to revert to the traditional process of pouring your filler into the water. This is obviously the way to do it when you've got larger amounts of filler and it's superior in the sense that you're less likely to get undissolved lumps. The trade-off obviously being it's more difficult to mix the right quantity of filler. And at this point I'm switching to one of my wider continental filler knives just because it gives a little bit more accuracy in the smoothing of the filler. A little bit of a tip with easy fill if you just wet your trowel, whatever it is you're using, it just enables you to draw it across the surface without pulling up away too much filler. You get a lovely smooth look like that. Now one of the tricks of filling anything, or even siliconing for that matter, is knowing when to stop. I'm happy with the way this looks now, I'm going to leave it to set. Now any pros watching this video may say, rather than leaving the filler proud like I've done, I should have left it flush as I did earlier on in the filling sequence, and then I can simply sand it down and apply any additional filler as I've done here later on. And they'd probably be right, but I'll leave it to you to decide as you hone your technique which process works best for you. And so we're on to sanding. If I was sanding a larger area, I'd be inclined to use something like this. I've had this for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, but you can pick them up pretty cheaply for under 50 pounds. But I decided instead to use this trade quality, non-clogging, 120 grit sandpaper I picked up from Screwfix, combined with my trusty sanding block. This stuff is great, even with the fine plaster dust generated by the Easy Fill, a quick vacuum, and the sandpaper is almost as good as new. Right, we've just got the odd area, as you can see here, where I just need a little bit more filler, even with my efforts to try and leave it proud of the surface. And using one of my widest continental filler knives, I have the relatively straightforward job of simply smoothing some additional filler onto these low points. Again, I'm just gonna very quickly. The brilliant thing about these filler knives and this is particularly good when you're filling cracks in the wall. See this crack here? Take a little bit of the filler onto the filler knife. Just lightly draw it across the surface. The crack's gone and will require almost no sanding before repainting. And that is why this is such good snagging filler. And a final quick sand of the touched up areas and the job is complete. Going back to the point I made earlier about the enhanced performance of powder fillers over ready mix, you'll have noticed when I applied this there was minimal slumpage which is pretty remarkable considering we've got a fill depth of around 25 millimeters and the fill is set to a rock hard finish just a couple of the reasons why I like working with this stuff. Well, why not use Easy Fill for the whole thing rather than combining with bonding, I hear you ask. Well, there's a very good reason for that, and it all comes down to cost. If you look at these two indicative examples from Wix, a typical UK retailer, the standard bonding at £9.60 for a 25 kilogram bag is 38 pence per kilogram. It's slightly more £12.40 for the bonding 60 version, whereas Easy Fill for a much smaller 10 kilogram bag is a whopping £21. 
That's two pounds 10 per kilogram or over five times more expensive. So hopefully I've given you some good techniques today to combine bonding with easy fill thereby saving yourself a lot of money. And that's it for today. I'm sorry I've gone on again in today's video. I just hope the context and the extra steps that I've given you give you all the detail that you need to make informed decisions about how you're going to approach your repair, snagging, filling job, whatever that may be. Don't forget details of all today's tools will be in the description below the video, which of course you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the little arrow and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. And stay tuned because over the next few weeks I've got a lot of videos coming up in this room. We've got mist coating and painting of the walls. We've got installation of skirting boards. And in a couple of months time, major project building a bespoke wardrobe system across one side of the room. So I'm massively grateful to you all for your continued interest in my channel. Can't thank you enough. If you've enjoyed today's video, do please click on the like button below. And as I always say, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me if you were to subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. See you soon.